So the Wiley House Museum is the 1835 home of the first president of IU, Andrew Wiley. He and his wife Margaret and 10 of their 12 children moved into this house after they had it built. And when they moved in, this was about 20 acres of farmland. Theophilus Wiley, who was Andrew Wiley's cousin, younger cousin, and his wife Rebecca moved in uh, after um, Andrew and Margaret Wiley passed away. So they moved in in about 1859. And sometime after that, they built the greenhouses to overwinter flowers. And so you can see the transition from Andrew Wiley and his family uh, running this 20 plus acre farm, uh, you know, to feed their family, make food, to Theophilus Wiley, the farm shrinks, and there's a really big focus on floriculture and gardening. So we've always been interested in that time period and working with Wiley House to do some uh, systematic excavations here. We have archival materials related to the family, thousands of letters, and a lot of those letters refer to flower gardening and the pits or the uh, greenhouses where they stored their flowers. Uh, and so that's why we specifically picked the subterranean greenhouse feature that we did. Since I first came here as the director, I have known and worked with the director of the Glenn Black Laboratory for Archaeology here at IU. And she and I have sort of um, dreamed and brainstormed about what would be possible and what would be really exciting here. And one of those um, projects would be to look for some of those outbuildings or structures. And so it was a project that we, we had hoped at some point we could do. And then the Bicentennial came along and there was an opportunity. Uh, so we're specifically looking for the sunken cold frame hot houses, as they called them, or the family really called them the pits. Uh, and these are actually drawn on the 1954 memory map uh, that Theophilus Wiley III, the grandson of Theophilus and Rebecca Wiley, uh, drew. And he actually drew two greenhouses and then another granddaughter wrote a letter and she indicated that there were two greenhouses, two pits. Uh, we have found one of them, uh, but essentially it's just a rectangular shaped piece of the ground that is differently colored than the surrounding subsoil. So it doesn't look uh, fairly remarkable in any way at this point, uh, but we will excavate that down and see how it was filled in and what it was filled in with. We're hoping that some of the original materials that were in the greenhouse, like um, planters, pots, things like that, might still be in place and were left in place when the pit was filled in. Based on the results of the ground penetrating radar, we placed two meter by two meter excavation units. Once we start digging those, we basically dig them in 10 centimeter arbitrary levels or controlled levels, so we dig out 10 centimeters at a time. Uh, we found a lot of things that are ubiquitous at historic sites for this time period, like transferware pottery, pieces of brick, mortar, nails, things that you would sort of expect to find. Uh, but we've definitely found some interesting artifacts that we didn't anticipate. We found a piece of a metal toy horse. Uh, we found a piece of a radio insulator, a ceramic radio insulator, and really one of the I don't want to say cutest, but one of the most exciting finds that we've been finding repeatedly are buttons. Again, that's not unexpected at a historic site, but there was one of our excavation units where we've had almost 10 buttons uh, come out, and it's actually right under a tree root that is still sort of disturbing where we're digging. And the, so the students have made a narrative that it's the button tree, and we're writing a children's book wow. now based on the button tree. So every year, a new batch of field school students, they have learned these methods and techniques in lecture halls and in laboratory sections, but they've never got to implement them uh, outside and get their hands dirty. Uh, but really, it's my favorite part about teaching students is even though we're working uh, on in 1860s layers, looking for an 1860s feature at this historic site in the middle of Bloomington, Indiana. They can take all of the skills that they learned here and the different methods, and they can go anywhere in the world or work in any time period and apply those. It's different from any college classes I've ever taken. Um, I think one of the biggest things I've taken out of it is just like all the processes and um, just like all the terms that you have to learn and um, 
making sure you measure something right, like all of those like little tactical things. Uh, my favorite part has been finding stuff. Um, it was kind of basic, but just hearing um, other people with their field experiences saying, oh, you know, we set out looking for this feature and then we never found it. Um, it's pretty exciting to see that we actually found what we're looking for. And it's always fun to find like the cool ceramic stuff that we're pulling out. I found a really neat um, <laughs> metal toy horse that was really fun to find. So it's just cool digging stuff up. The students not only get to learn everything that goes into a field school, right, and all the basics of, of that and the logistics of that, but they're also learning how to communicate about the project. Because we're such a public-facing uh, unit of campus, they um, are getting a lot of visitors. One of the most important things you can do in archaeology is involve the public or disseminate your results uh, in your projects to the public because the public is interested in what we do. But it's also one of our, our duties as archaeologists is to educate and inform the community. Uh, and what that does is that creates archaeological advocates in the community that are aware of cultural resources and the heritage that we need to manage collectively. Not only is this just uh, sort of campus cultural heritage, I know this is Bloomington cultural heritage and part of our deeper Hoosier heritage. Indiana University, Bicentennial.